bless me. And we're also lucky that, that this is one of the first things we shot, and I think it gave all of us a real sense of confidence in, in what we were doing and where we were going. Now, we're shooting from Roger's set built in Auckland to here we are now in the Czech Republic. And the Czech Republic again. And we we're just about to have an overhead shot, which is shot on the stage. Back wasn't on the it? stage, yeah. We're back on the stage. So we're back in New Zealand on the other side of the world. This is on stage. And yes, the exterior of Mr. Thomas is on stage. But now we're about to cut to another shot where it's uh, we're actually in in the Czech Republic, aren't we? Yeah, this is this one is one of the huge advantages of scouting so far ahead of time and spending all your winters in Central Europe, which is what I've done for the last three years is that I was able to choose a lot of locations ahead of time and uh, and take Roger there and then he actually sent the art department there to even take squeezes off the rocks and really reproduce some of these sets. But the interesting thing about this set is that Roger gypped me a little bit because <laughs> when we got to the location and it was normally you know when you reproduce something on stage you end up making it smaller but strangely enough I got to the location and found out that Roger had actually built the set bigger than the real location. No, not very much like him at all really. My father's fragile. Yeah, Ro Roger, <laughs> you, you, you have a response? <laughs> now, you know, I do remember having that discussion very early on, and you said, well, we've got a bit more space, and I just think it would be great to be able to have that space to shoot around, and I thought, thought great and everything, and then forgot all about it till we got to the location and uh, went, to, went to try and find an angle and realized I couldn't actually get the camera as far away as I could on the set. But looking at it now, it, all, it just... It just slots into the location stuff. It really does. And and uh, that was actually, to be honest, a real piece of luck from a snow perspective because we uh, we went and, and tech scouted all of these locations and um, they looked fantastic. We went and shot some stage work at Barrandoff Studios in the Czech Republic. And in the meantime, they had a week of heat wave. And the night before we were due to shoot those shots at Mr. Tumnus's house, the, uh, there was slush. There was about four inches of slush, brown slush on the ground. And we were all prepared to move to Poland the next day and just shoot something completely different. And we got 20 centimeters of snow overnight and were able to continue shooting. And the depth of snow is almost identical to what we, you know, sort of guessed it might yeah. be in the studio. Very, very fortunate. Well, that's good. Because this probably won't sound anything like one. <clears throat> this is a lovely set. This is one of my favorites and turned out to be one of James McAvoy's favorites because he's, uh, he's a big collector of Art Deco furniture. Art Nouveau. Art Nouveau furniture. Yeah. yeah. We had this little theme of not, not the formal Art Nouveau, but the sort of lovely carved organic shapes of the wood in Art Nouveau furniture. And so we... We thought that suited the little house of a fawn, and uh, yeah, I remember we were really thinking about the the aspects of fawns that they would they would make a lot of things from woods and natural shapes, and that Art Nouveau actually reflected a lot of those natural plant-like shapes. Incidentally, this is the first piece of original music we heard. Yes, it is, and it was a surprise to Georgie because <laughs> she'd been listening to James blowing through that little flute for about two days before we actually played the real music. Again, I think it, uh, this, this piece of music helped us sort of find the tone of the film very early on. It was a piece that Harry wrote while actually working on other films, but he just sort of threw himself into it. One of the things that we did in shooting this is we decided early on with, uh, with Don McAlpine to shoot pretty much all of the night stuff as day for night. And uh, we decided pretty early on to, to do a digital intermediate, a DI which meant that we had a lot more control over turning daylight shots to nighttime. And so we decided to give everything this kind of very distinct bluish light in the Narnian night. And it gave us a lot of control over, uh, over the night look. It also meant obviously we, could, we had much more flexibility over our shooting hours. And then very luckily towards the end of the movie meant that I could take a scene that originally I was going to do at nighttime and switch it around and use it for daytime. So it was a very fortuitous decision. I think Andrew's going to shoot all his films from now on, day, day for night, so he can decide later after he's finished whether, <laughs> whether or not he wants it to be a day or night scene. He just shoot, randomly shoot a whole bunch of scenes and then see if he can make a film out of them. Yeah. Right. I'm going to go for the Ed Wood approach. <laughs> we, we're supposed to turn it over to her. Mr. Thomas, you need it. 
this was a very hard scene for Georgie. It was one of the first sort of really emotional scenes, and she had grown very, very fond of James and was really personally upset by him crying here. And uh, I remember she went home very, very upset at the end of the day that, that James was so torn up. This is now running uh, on stage and then in the Czech Republic again. Oh, it's Matty's world, well, doesn't it? Can you find your way back from here? I think so. The lamppost has an interesting bit of history. The lamppost, um, the reason it is there is that it grew there. Um, in the first story, The Magician's Nephew, the witch goes berserk in London, uh, in Victorian London, breaks off a piece of a London lamppost and starts, you know, creating havoc with it. Just about the time that it, she's whisked back into Narnia. Um, and she throws away this piece of lamppost, which is probably the little piece that sticks out just underneath the light where the gas lights, lighter's ladder is, is usually leans. But um, because it's Narnia, this little piece of lamppost then grew into into a lamppost, and there it is. And if you look carefully around the bottom of it, there are sort of root-like forms, not woody roots, but um, cast iron type roots. Yeah, it was basically right at the formation as Aslan was singing Narnia to life, and because there was so much you know, stuff coming to life, the lamppost itself came to life. For those who have noticed on the wardrobe as well, that's also it got the history really of the magician's nephew carved into the front because the story in the magician's nephew for, for those who don't know was really the professor's story and he'd gone there as a child and come back with an apple which he'd given to his mother and it had cured her of an illness and then he planted the apple core it grew into a tree and when the tree died he had it made into the wardrobe so we thought in the design of the wardrobe would be great that the professor would have in, incorporated his story and all the panels on the wardrobe really tell the story of the magician's nephew and that's an original idea of, of yours, because it's not in the book, is it? It's not. I mean, interesting enough, when C.S. Lewis wrote this book, he didn't actually know that the professor had been to Narnia, um, because at the time, this was the first book. I think he wrote it very stream of consciousness. And uh, he wrote The Magician's Nephew, I think, as the fifth or sixth book he wrote in the series. And then he tied a lot of things together. So in approaching this, because I'd grown up and read all seven books, I kind of wanted this movie to be reflective of one, the larger world that's reflected in all those other books, but also the things that had happened in those other stories, and really added the whole aspect in this story that the professor did know about Narnia. And it really made his character more interesting, and the scene with the professor much more interesting to have him have that little bit of foreknowledge. And if you want to learn more about the wardrobe and see the carvings in more detail, you have to buy the excellent book of the making of the film by producer Perry Moore, which goes into a description of all the carved panels and how it relates to Magician's Nephew. What, uh, what wood is the, uh, is the wardrobe made out of, Roger? It's um, apple wood, which of course, because the wardrobe was made from the apple tree that grew from the apple that came back from Narnia. Uh, so, it, you know, it has a, it's a very complex history, but um, the professor made the wardrobe from the wood of the apple tree which uh, was blown eventually blown over in a storm which is why it has such magical properties the wardrobe now did you actually did you use real apple wood we used we used let's call it a fruit wood which is very a fruit wood very similar to apple wood in texture and color we weren't able to obtain apple wood but we got the very closest we could what amazed me, because I never realized it either, is those uh, is the actual carvings of sculptures rather than carvings that you actually then painted to look like the wood. And it was a remarkable job. They were sculpted um, to look like wood carvings, yes, and, uh, and then fitted into the wood and painted to match the wardrobe. So, in a sense, we're, t we're telling fibs a little bit, but um, you'd have to actually go out and touch them to see that, that they weren't. I don't think I knew even after touching them. I think I didn't know who <laughs> told me. <laughs> this is a bit of a change in, in order of story because uh, in the original story, Lucy, first of all, stepped into the wardrobe willingly while they were exploring the house and discovered Narnia. 
and then the second time that she went in was during a game of hide and seek and I, I couldn't really understand why a kid while exploring a house would just haphazardly open a wardrobe and step through it I, other than of course in natural curiosity but I felt it the second time she went in it would be more about questioning her own belief questioning her own imagination and starting to wonder if what had happened was real and all of those kind of things so I switched it around and made the first occurrence actually while playing hide and seek which seemed very natural and the second occurrence you know about her just starting to doubt herself and and uh, you know sort of having that confirmed although there was the clue that she really did believe in herself because she put her wellies on before going to the wardrobe oh that that's true I hadn't even thought about that but you know several times in the film when she points out the it says the the equivalent of told you it was true and there's a lot that uh, that she's asked that her 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 sister and brothers to believe that where they don't quite where where they don't believe her, and of course she true it turns out to be correct every time. Yeah, she really does represent that that openness, that belief in herself, the imagination. We're just about to um, just have a look at one of the best props in the film, actually. Why are you particularly fond of this prop? I think it was a great design. I mean, as you know, you and I took some time to get there with it, but um, the end result, I think, was remarkable. And it's a remarkable um, tribute to the craftsmanship of the, of the, you know, the guys in the metalworking and the construction department. The White Witch's sleigh. It's a beautiful thing. Beautifully constructed and crafted. Yeah, it was very challenging to make something that sort of looked, you know, modern and interesting, but sort of had a period feel and really seemed to be of the White Witch's world. I know we went through a lot of a lot of variations on that design. The other interesting thing there is the, the reindeer, which, of course, we couldn't bring into New Zealand because it turns out that... Uh, they they potentially carry, although they they not they don't display any symptoms of a bovine disease. And uh, New Zealand is a heavily agricultural country, and we we're basically told that any reindeer stepping off a boat would be shot on sight. So, <laughs> so we were left with the challenge of having to find another way of doing them, and uh, and ended up doing them as a combination of animatronic and CG. Uh, yes, a man named Mark Rappaport built the uh, built these the ones that we see here, and then they had off camera a number of operators working everything from tails to necks to uh, to antlers and then when we see them at the very beginning when they're charging forward pulling the sleigh those are CG. And in fact if you're lucky enough to have a father who's a producer on a big movie you can get to operate a reindeer's tail. <laughs> Although I don't believe we called it a tail. <laughs> <laughs> This was a this was a very interesting and challenging scene. Tilda and I had decided very early on that at any stage if you stopped this scene, we didn't want to know whether the White Witch was really bad or not. We wanted to, to make it kind of ambiguous so you could see that Edmund would fall for her. And the challenge really in, in doing something like that is to to make a character who is ambiguous without creating an ambiguous character, one that is just not defined or that an actor doesn't understand. And it made the scene very, very challenging to shoot. We were so much struggling to avoid the cliche of, you know, the evil stepmom or Cruella de Vil or all of those sort of evil women characters we've seen over the years. And I really wanted the White Witch to be more sophisticated, more, more sort of a cold, sophisticated type of evil. And it made the scene very, very difficult to do, particularly as it was the first scene that we had to shoot and it was one where the character doesn't get to be herself. It's right. It was Tilda's very first scene, and I think she will freely admit she was still at the in the process of discovering her character. And it was, uh, you know, she made this wonderful decision early on with you that rather than be scary by by dint of her 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 raising her voice or threatening, she has decided to be cold and indifferent, which is something that that probably scares children more than anything else an adult. Who seemingly is emotionless, and that's why the Edmund character so desperately needs needs her. He misses his mother. He misses, needs the comfort. He, quite frankly, needs in this circumstance he needs the warmth, and he's hungry, 
and yet doesn't entirely what, know what to make of her. And she has one moment here where I think it probably alerts the audience that uh, she's somebody who shouldn't be entirely trusted. Yeah, this, this Ed, the Edmund character was the first real character I sort of started fleshing out from the point of view of trying to trying to find what it was that C.S. Lewis was hinting at with most of his characterizations. And I kind of decided early on that it was as if this story had really happened and C.S. Lewis had written about it in a way that children could understand, but I wanted to find the reality of all of the characters. And Edmund was a good place to start because, like me, he's a third child and consequently is immediately resentful of any of his siblings. But in particular, he's a child whose father's away at war, whose mother's involved in the war effort. He's been left on his own a lot more. His older brother is now telling him what to do, and this woman offers him position over his older brother. And yes, the Turkish, there's the enchanted Turkish delight and all of those kind of things, but the real character decision is based on the fact that he's been pushed around, his brother's mishandling him, and of course he's going to betray him. That sleigh was actually a bit of a, a special effects challenge as well, just to actually be able to pull it along, a lot of cables and tracks and so on hidden under the snow. Oh. Edmund, you got in too. Isn't it wonderful? Where have you been? With Mr. Tumnus. He's fine. The White Witch hasn't found out anything about him meeting me. The White Witch? She calls herself the Queen of Narnia, but she really isn't. And with the, um, the goblet of um, hot chocolate and the casket of Turkish Delight. That was uh, wet at the Weta workshop, the first of many contributions to the film. We must have designed hundreds of Turkish Delight boxes before coming upon one. It was such a such an icon and so hard to decide upon. What are you talking about? No, yet it's all in the wardrobe, like I told you! This scene I still notice that this is definitely shot slightly out of order because Skanda looks so young in this. I think this is, you know, within about the second or third week of shooting. And uh, he's the one I noticed having changed the most in that length of time. He, of course, grew about five and a half, six inches during production. Well, he didn't actually go there with me. He... What were you doing, Edmund? I was just playing along. This moment coming up when uh, Georgie had to cry was the first scene that she had to display a lot of emotion as well. And I remember I was trying to do all sorts of things to get her to cry, and I was sitting off camera trying to make myself cry and getting her to look into my eyes and cry. And it ended up being the, the best way to achieve it was to actually have Anna Popperwell, who was uh, playing the part of Susan, who's a brilliant crier, to actually sit off screen, and, uh, and she got Georgie to tear up there. And then we see Jim Broadbent for the first time. Jim is so fantastic in this. He really has that wonderful sparkle of knowing of, this, of the foreknowledge of Narnia and this... You know, he still exists. He still has that open, childish wonderment that uh, Lucy has, and they sort of have that in common. And you just really see that sparkle in his eye. I remember when he came on to set for the first time, because it was a fairly short role for him, is just as he put his costume on, he just slowly transformed into the professor. He was Jim Broadbent, and he'd pick up his pipe, put on his smoking jacket, and you'd just see him slowly kind of shuffle into this character. It was great to watch. It's uh, one of the, uh, the the tricks of filmmaking that Jim Broadbent was probably with us for no more than a week, and yet he has a significant uh, sort of presence and, and uh, uh, role in the film. He's upset. And just weeping. It's nothing. We can handle it. This is the, his study, of course, which was a lot of fun to design and, and dress again. Kerry Brown, the set decorator, had a wonderful time. When we, as we worked out, you know what the professor might, what his background might be, and and all the little things on his desk that he's collected from around the world, and including that very incidental, but one of the props that uh, that Weta built that I loved is the the little silver apple, which again has the it's his uh, his tobacco case, and again has the story of the magician's nephew with Fledge and so on and on, sort of engraved into it. And it's, it's such a, you know, you just go by it fairly quickly, but it's such a lovely little prop. Roger, had you worked with Kerry Brown on any other films? I've worked with Kerry for several years, Mark. Yeah, we, I would be quite disappointed to have to do a film without her. She's um, extremely clever and uh, 
very gifted, talented. I know that that's uh, you know historically an essential relationship that between the production designer and the and the set decorator. So it it, it given how accomplished your sets are in the, on, on this film, I would have been surprised that the two of you never worked together before. Yeah, no, we have, and, uh, and it's a good, really good relationship. Of course, we've worked with Don before as well, and uh, very successfully, and so we've sort of built up a bit of a, a way of working together. So Andrew and I were the interlopers. <laughs> Well, it was great, though, because it meant we really didn't have to do anything. That's true. Exactly. <laughs>